I'm with Gidon Ramati, and we're here to hear his story through a translation. First of all, Gidon, your mother fled Nazi Czechoslovakia in 1940. Tell us about that story. My story begins in 1940. I was with a group of, I think he said, 3,800 refugees who were fleeing from the Nazis and went to Bratislava, which is in Czechoslovakia. On the 1st of September 1940, we received permission from the Nazi authorities that we were going to be allowed to go out to the land of Israel. Mm -hmm. He was in this group of 3,800 refugees. He was one of the group. On the 1st of September, he was two weeks old. Wow. And yeah. also his, his parents, his, his mother's sister, and a, a small baby, just six months old. And we went down the Danube River towards Romania. And we, um, after three days, we arrived at, at the port in Romania. And uh, there, there were three ships that were waiting to release us and deliver us to take us to the land of Israel. The ships were called Milos, Pacific and Atlantic. We went up on the Atlantic ship, which was the biggest of the three, and we sailed towards Israel. In the first days, the ships were sailing as they needed to. There didn't seem to be any problems. So when we passed the, the Bosphorus, the Dardanelles the, by Turkey, and we got to, to the Mediterranean, then we started to have some problems with the ships. I am so ill, my lord. The, the sea was very stormy. So the conditions were very bad on the ship. There was actually room for 300 people to be transported safely on the ship, but they let 1,800 people onto the ship. There we proceeded very, very slowly. We were about halfway there when the fuel ran out on the ship. Oh. So we started to cut up anything made of wood on the ship, the beds, the cupboards, closets, everything that we could to use as fuel. And slowly, slowly we progressed and towards Haifa. We arrived in Haifa on the 24th of November. We'd been about three months uh, at sea. Because of the crowding on the ship, there had been an outbreak of typhus, and as a number of people died, and we wrapped them in uh, talit pressures and put them in the water. We arrived, as I said, on the 24th of November in Haifa, and the British informed us that we would not be allowed to enter the port. There was a very old ship there, a really ancient ship. It had been French. They called that ship, then renamed it the Patria. And we were told that you will go on this very ancient ship and it's going to take you to the island of Mauritius. There were already 2,000 people on this old ship that had been on the other two boats, the Pacific and the Milus, that had come with us from Romania. Yeah. So the next morning, some small boats came and they started to transfer people from our ship, the Atlantic, onto this old ship, the Patria. The first 100 went down to the boats. We sailed to the Patria. My father was not with us. He was supposed to be coming afterwards later on with, the, with our luggage, the cases. We get to the Patria, we come up onto the boat, and a British officer or policeman took us down to the, to the lower levels of the, of the ship, lower decks. And he said, you wait here until the others all come and bring the luggage. The, my mother was there with her friend Hannah, and we sat down and waited. And after about half an hour, we heard suddenly a big explosion. So the explosion was caused by the Haganah Israel forces who'd planted an explosive device on the ship to prevent her from leaving and taking us to Mauritius. That was their goal. So the explosion was too strong. They'd made a mistake. Instead of blowing a small hole in the ship and damaging it slightly, which had been the intention, it blew away half of the wall. The water started coming into the ship. My mother's legs were in the water. And she saw that people were running to get to the steps to, to climb up to the higher decks. So my mother said to her friend Hannah, who also had a small baby, a few months old, we have to go up with everybody else. We can't stay down here. Hannah said, I don't have strength for that. And she stayed. And we never saw her again. <laughs> or her baby. So my mother managed to, to climb up some, some steps and to get up to the higher deck. And she saw people jumping into the water. Some of them were jumping and were injuring themselves, breaking their arms or legs. And my mother said, I can't jump into the water. I don't know how to swim. I have a baby in my hands, in my arms. She yeah. grabs hold of some young boy. And she said, take my baby and jump into the water and I will jump in after you. He took me under his, his arm in his armpit and jumped in the water. And my mother jumped in after him. And she managed to be saved close to the boat. And someone in a small boat managed to pull her in into the boat from the water. And he immediately then sailed towards the, the port to the, the landing stage. So after a few minutes, this, this small boat arrived. 
at, at the shore, and they were waiting for British policemen mm -hmm. with buses and trucks, and they put the people into these b buses, into the trucks. Yeah, they, I mean, I mean, not with I mean, her baby, but I mean, they took his mother. So and they took his mother to the Atlete camp, which is just south of Haifa. And when they arrived at Atlete, they took all the survivors from this Patria disaster where the, the ship had gone down for disinfection. She went through this process and immediately she was released. She ran to the gate to see if, if somebody was coming with her baby. And this baby didn't arrive. And it got to the evening and the last of the survivors from the Patria sinking arrived and her baby didn't arrive. And then she turned to one of the British officers and uh, explained to him what had happened to her. And the British officer said to her, tomorrow in the morning I will come to find you, be ready for me, and I will take you to Haifa to look for your baby. And he did come the next morning and they travelled to Haifa. And they went to all the hospitals, to orphanages, to other rescue places where the baby might have been taken and they didn't find anybody or anything. So they went back to Atlit. She was in a lot of pain because her, her bra was filled with, with milk because she hadn't been able to, to suckle her baby. And she was running around the camp looking for mothers with, with babies to, to relieve the pain, to, to suckle from her. And then the, that helped her. She found some babies that she could nurse and that, that helped her. And this is how things passed, went on for a few days, three or four days. And the British officer turned up again. And he said he got a phone call from a, at an army camp on the Carmel. And uh, they said in the army clinic, they actually had several babies that, that didn't seem to belong to anyone. No one had claimed as them they belonged to them. And if you want, I can take you to this camp, to this clinic, and we can look again for your baby. So they went to this, this army camp, this army base on the Carmel. They went into the clinic and the sister, the nurse, took them to a room at the side. There were eight babies lying there. They had all been injured. They were in, not in a good condition in one way or another. She goes looking at the babies. She doesn't recognize anybody. And then she saw one of the babies had a pacifier on a shoelace around its neck, and she recognized the shoelace. She said it had belonged to her husband. And she said to the nurse, please take the bandage off the baby's eyes. And the bandage is taken off the baby's eyes and she cries out, this is my baby. The, the baby was quite ill uh, with a fever. Okay, and the, the, the baby was really quite sick. So the nurse said, please leave the baby here a few days so we can look after him until he, he, he'll get better and he'll recover. And after a few days, my mother was able to take me, which is this baby, and um, take the baby back to the camp at Hatleet with her. And he was in that camp for nine months until um, they were released. This is where he learned to sit and to walk and went through all these developmental stages in the camp at Hatleet. This well, is my story, but I want to add that when the Patria sank, there were 270 of the new immigrants of the refugees, the Jews from Europe, who, who drowned in that disaster, and a number of um, the staff, the crew of the ship, were also killed. And one of the, the two of the people killed was my mother's friend, Hannah, and her six-month-old daughter. Can I continue and say what happened to my father? Yes, yes. yes please do. Okay. My father had been in a small boat on his way to board the Patria. He saw what happened, he heard the explosion. And of course, they turned around all the small boats and took them straight back to the Atlantic ship. Okay, so they, after a few days, they took all of those that were still left on the Atlantic. It was 1,700. And they took them also to the Atlete camp, but they kept them separately from those that had survived the Patria disaster. They were locked up in a separate place. And the British told them that their intention was to send them to the island of Mauritius. The, there's, there is a, a law, a naval law, that those who have survived the sinking of a ship couldn't be sent on another ship to go to Mauritius. So those that had been on the Patria, they were, were not able to send to Mauritius. But uh, those that had not been on that ship that sunk were going to be sent anyway to Mauritius. Two weeks later, the British bought two more ships. And they wanted to take those who'd not been involved in the Patria sinking and disaster to put them on these ships and take them to Mauritius. They tried to protest and they had no way to defend themselves or fight back or protest. So they decided that they would protest by making themselves naked, being naked. And the British bought 
some Arabs people in and they mistreated these people, pushed them and forced them and got them onto the buses to take them back to Haifa port. Arab policemen. Arab policemen they brought in to do this. And they got on those two boats and sailed to Mauritius. After a, a journey sailing for about uh, two weeks, they arrived in Mauritius. And in Mauritius, they divided the men from the women and children. The men were put in the island prison, and the women and children were put in tin huts next to the prison. And they lived there for, for some years. After a few weeks, they gave the men a little more freedom. They were allowed to come out of the prison. But they went back into the prison to sleep at night. And after some time, they allowed the men who had wives and children there to meet for brief periods with their wives and children. And that's why there were also children born to these prisoners in Mauritius. So my, my father, my mother's sister and brother and another baby, they were, they were all interned on Mauritius. Uh, fortunately, there was an, a very bad outbreak of malaria in the camp. Uh, my father also became ill, um, and there were about 60 people who died of malaria. So after about a year and a half, the British said to the male prisoners, they said, any young men who are willing to, to join and fight with the British army in the war, they can get out of here. And 300 young men volunteered. One of them was my father, his brother, and um, my mother's sister's husband. So they were, uh, these 300 volunteers were taken to South Africa to an army camp. They were then, then divided into different groups to, to send to fight in different places. So his father and his brother were put in a unit to fight in Arab lands for the British Army. And my mother's sister's husband learned to work on the tanks. And he sent it to, to England. He went to England. And he was a British tank driver in lots of different places throughout Europe. There's another some, uh, some uh, my father and his brother sent to Egypt, to Alexandria port. And then he fight against the German and Italian airplanes that uh, come to bomb Alexandria port. After some uh, weeks, the German and Italian uh, airplane start to bomb in Haifa, the port and the refineries in Haifa. And my father sent it to to Haifa back, to the refineries in, in, in Haifa. He was sent back to Haifa? Yeah, yes. his father was then sent back to Haifa when the, the Italians and German planes started with bombing the, with, the refineries. With, with some, with some uh, Jewish people from, the, from Mauritius. And my father uh, sent a letter to my mother. My mother was in kibbutz, Givat Shlosha, and he, he tell her that he, in the, the refinery in Haifa, you can come to visit us. And he take me and we go to Haifa to refineries and we met our father. How old were you when you met your father? Three years old. And this is the first time that I met my father and I asked my mother, who is this soldiers? <laughs> okay, now wow. this is the end of the story. You, you escaped anti-Semitism in Europe and today we're seeing a lot of anti-Semitism and we're seeing the terrorist attack on Israel. You now have grandchildren fighting in Gaza, don't you? Tell us about that. I have a story that is similar to what is happening today. In the War of Independence of Israel in 1948, we were living in the kibbutz kvam. Not far, not far from uh, Ashkelon. It's close to Ashkelon. The Egyptian army was, was approaching the kibbutz. And after a few weeks, the government of Israel decided to remove all the women and children from the kibbutz and just leave the men still living there. This sure, is sure exactly what's happening today to the kibbutzes, the, the villages near to Aza, near to Gaza. And we were taken to Rishon Lezion, which is further north. And they created a kindergarten for us. And they put mattresses down on the floor, and that's where we slept. And they went into the synagogue and took out all the benches and put some mattresses down there so there was more place for people to sleep. And there, we were there for two weeks. There was a very hard time. There was also attacks against Rishon Etzion, where we were staying. And after two weeks, they then moved us again to a hotel in Jaffa. And we actually spent nine months in that hotel. And this is exactly what's happening to the people from the border communities around Gaza today. Mm. And after nine months, they took us back to see what remained of our kibbutz after the war. It was completely destroyed. 
the father showed us where where we had lived and slept. There was just a, a bunker under the ground. And uh, we went back to Jaffa for another month until they were able to, to fix things up and, and do some repairs. You must be very proud of your grandchildren fighting in Gaza. They're defending the country. I don't envy them, he said. <laughs> They've just been there three months. We were ten months away from our home because of, of what was going on. It's very, very difficult. And for ten months I was without my father again, mm. separated from my father. Well, Gidon, thank you very much for sharing your story. Thank you. Thank you too. Did you hear me?